it's now my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Alan Page. Justice Page was born in Canton, Ohio. He graduated from Canton Central Catholic, received his BA from Notre Dame, and his JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. After graduating from law school, he worked as an attorney with a law firm in Minneapolis, then served seven years as an attorney in the office of the Minnesota Attorney General. He sought election to the Minnesota Supreme Court in 1992 and won, becoming the first African American on the court and one of the few associate justices ever to join the court initially through election rather than appointment. When Justice Page was reelected in 1998, he received the most votes in Minnesota history. He was reelected in 2004 and 2010 and served until he reached the mandatory retirement age of 70 in 2015. Some of you might know that law was Alan Page's second career. He was also a pretty decent football player. <laughs> At Notre Dame, he led the school's storied football program to the 1966 National Championship, and in 1993, he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. He was a first-round draft choice of the Minnesota Vikings in 1967, and he played for the Vikings until 1978. Now, what Minnesotans sometimes forget is that he finished his career playing three seasons for the greatest football team in human history, my hometown Chicago Bears. <laughs> During his NFL career, Alan Page played in 218 consecutive games, earning All-Pro honors six times, and was voted to nine consecutive Pro Bowls. He remains one of only two defensive players in history to be named MVP of the league, and in 1988, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Also in 1988, Justice Page and his wife Diane founded the Page Education Foundation, which assists Minnesota students of color in their pursuit of post-secondary education. To date, the foundation has awarded $14 million in grants to nearly 7,000 students. Please welcome Alan Page. Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, let me just say it's a good thing that, and I'm happy that, everybody had a seat when the music stopped. <laughs> President Sullivan, Dean Vischer, members of the law school administration, faculty, staff, family and friends of today's graduates, and most importantly, the class of 2018. Let me begin by saying thank you. Thank you for the warmth of your welcome and for allowing me to share my thoughts with you on this very special occasion. Now, the day I received my law degree, it would not have occurred to anyone present that I might someday be speaking to a graduating class such as yours as a former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice. But like the path that brought me to this moment, the path that each of you graduates take will provide an opportunity for you to accomplish that which you never dreamed possible. The key to whatever success I have had, however defined, can be found in an unwillingness to be satisfied with playing to the level of the competition, a willingness to push beyond my self-perceived limitations, and a willingness to be involved in the community around me. These qualities have served me well, and I believe that they could serve each of you well. Congratulations, graduates, for a job well done. Your preparation and hard work have paid off, and you should be proud. What a wonderful gift you have given yourselves. And I can appreciate the conflicting emotions that you may be experiencing, from the relief of having no more lectures, finals, or tuition, to the anticipation, coupled with what I suspect is maybe a little bit of apprehension that comes with new beginnings, to the 
sense of accomplishment and pride that all of us share this afternoon and the fear that your graduation speaker will drone on forever, <laughs> saying nothing of particular relevance, and prolonging the moment until the real celebration can begin. Recognizing that what I, might, what I say here today might well not be long remembered, normally I would focus my remarks on the future, on hope, and the role that each of us can play in making the future better and brighter. Today I want to focus on something a little bit different, something that I perceive to be a clear and present danger to our collective future. That something is the decline in, our, in both our political and our general discourse. When we look around, we see greed, a lack of civility, if not aggressive incivility, political leaders saying one thing and then doing something entirely different, and lately the acceptance of, in some circles, of political bullying tactics as the norm. If such bullying is acceptable at the highest levels of our government, why isn't it acceptable for the average Jane or Joe or Jane or Joe's children. Of even greater concern to me are political, to me, are political leaders who appear to see no problem in making demonstrably false statements as a matter of course. When our leaders send the message that lying is okay, our democracy is headed for serious trouble. Clearly, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. And as you learned here at the law school, it is fair to have a debate about the reasonable inferences to be drawn from the available facts. But none of us, none of us are entitled to our own facts. We cannot afford to have lying become normalized. We must be intentional about calling out lies and about talking to young people about not lying because lying strikes at the heart of trust, and without trust, we have nothing. I believe that what we're seeing is what we've been seeing in, in athletics for a long time. It's the equivalent of, intimidation, of the intimidation and taunting seen on athletic fields. To me, this reflects and is symptomatic of a real decline in our character. Now, the American Heritage Dictionary defines character as moral or ethical strength, integrity, fortitude. In a sense, character is who we are at our core. It's what determines what we believe and how we respond to a given situation. Character is not something with it we're born with, and it does not develop automatically. It must be consciously developed. Nor is it something that is static. Whether you're 50 or 15, 5 or 75, a member of the St. Thomas Law School administration, faculty or staff, one of today's graduates, family member or friend of a graduate, or a former Supreme Court justice, you will be forced to renew and reevaluate your character again and again. To resist the pressures and temptations that seduce us to make the easy choices rather than the right choices takes a strong person. And I don't mean strong in the physical sense, for physical stature really has nothing to do with character. I do mean, however, strong in the sense of believing that each one of us has an obligation to act in ways that builds rather than diminishes our character and the character of those around us. That means we must be honest and trustworthy, saying what we mean and meaning what we say. It means keeping our promises, playing fairly, telling the truth, making decisions with others in mind, always treating people with respect and respecting ourselves. It means working to figure out the difference between right and wrong and then doing what is right. 
the fact that I was once considered to be a great football player or that I was a Supreme Court justice by itself doesn't mean that I am a man of good character. The fact that the color of my skin may be different from yours doesn't mean that I am not a man of good character. The fact that your language, religion, or gender may be different from mine doesn't make either one of our characters better or worse. The outward differences which identify us as individuals do not define the content of our character. That is defined by how we act on an ongoing basis. Through our actions, we have the power to impact not only our own character, but the character of those around us. Consciously applying the values, you, the values you learned here at St. Thomas will serve you well as you strive to be a person of good character. Doing so will also serve you well as you go forward to make a difference in the world. Before I close, I beg your indulgence just for a moment. For me, the law is about justice and ensuring justice. Etched into the facade of the United States Supreme Court building are the words equal justice under law. But the law has not always provided justice, much less equal justice, to all segments of our society. In my view, until we all receive justice, we will none of us receive justice. As law school graduates, you, members of the class of 2018, are among the privileged few. I ask that you use that privilege, the power that comes with that privilege, and the legal tools that you learned at this great law school to bend the moral arc of history toward justice. Thank you and congratulations.